and welcome back from Chicago. This is Domestic Booster Pumps Part 2. Of week 4. Here's another tip for you. The screwdriver flat blade goes into the slot on the screw. Welcome to Hi-Rise Plumbing Design Online. I'm David DeBoard with UCLA Extension University. This is week four, part two. This will be a pretty short presentation. Remember to look at the other things that I have put online. So I will be going through this rather quickly, but I need you, there are a lot of numbers. You have to come back and look at those yourself to get a full understanding. Let's look at some types of systems. We have constant speed. That's where the pumps are running with or without PRVs. Usually they have PRVs to reduce the discharge pressure to the building. They're strongly recommended to have PRVs so that you don't overpressurize the system. But uh, these pumps run wide open. The no flow shutdown based on temperature and time or temperature only uh, and not a set point. Pumps turn on based on a set point. So it's basically like having your foot on the gas to the floor and then you're using a brake to modulate the speed of the car or in this case the flow of the water. Here we see that there's a, a low flow operation area. But it's an example of the uh, of a pump curve which we spoke about before. So with with constant speed pumps it's what we usually have is a jockey pump or you know a lot of times in fire protection we call the little pump the jockey pump but the jockey pump is a smaller pump that runs basically pretty much all the time to 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 pick up the flows because most of the flow in a building is rather small. The pumps don't really run full out, if ever, just occasionally. Most of the time one pump can handle everything. So we usually make the first pump in a constant speed system. We would have one pump that's smaller, the lead pump, and then we'd have the backup pumps that uh, would be larger for when that load is, is needed that pressure, that uh, flow. So where's the best area on the curve to size a pump for continuous operation? Typical demand in, in most buildings is far to the left of the curve. Everything is pretty much oversized most of the, most of the time. We need to match the pressures on all of the pumps in the system. It's similar to a jockey boiler system. You might have one small boiler that's picking up uh, the small loads, like the domestic water heater, perhaps. Uh, we also call this a hybrid system. Sometimes you might have a couple of high efficiency units and one not so efficient, but it's much smaller. And we want to reduce cycling. So the, the less you can reduce uh, make the pump start and stop. You have less wear and tear on the motors, the bearings, the seals, etc. And also the power consumption. You get a big inrush of current whenever a pump starts from scratch. Variable speed systems are a lot different. Pumps run based on a pressure set point and work to maintain it. No flow shutdown is based on pressure and time. Restart is based on pressure. And then you have hybrid systems. You might combine a lead variable speed pump with the follower constant speed pumps. And this allows one pump to carry the bulk of the load. The variable speed pump maximizes efficiency for pretty much most of the time. And the system is between uh, efficiency and price of constant versus variable speed. These days, variable speeds are practically the same cost. It doesn't make any sense to me, for the most part, to use constant speeds. It would be very, very um, rare 
to specify constant speed these days. The, the variable speeds have a slow start, slow stop, so you don't need a, 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 a slow starter because it starts by its, it already starts that way. And it can adjust itself. You can save quite a bit of energy. Plus, if all the pumps are variable speed and sized the same, then they can alternate the load between the lead pump and the follow pumps. So that is a good thing. Instead of wearing out that one pump, that's because it's running practically all the time, now you can, uh, every day or so, you can switch from pump one to pump two to pump three. Sometimes we look at the uh, the pump curves also. The, a flat pump curve runs different than a steep pump curve. We might look at that a little bit later. Here's a just an idea of an office building and how often, how many hours the pump is running at this capacity. So at 10% or less, it's almost 12 hours. And 25% is less than four hours and, and 45 is less than four hours and 70 is less than four hours and at 95 percent it's usually less than an hour that it's running at that rate so basically we have to size it based on the loads but the loads never occur this is a little bit hard to read but it gives you a potential uh, energy cost and a potential energy so you can figure out the energy savings. Take a closer look at that later. Um, here's more, this goes with that. This is the VFDs versus the constant speed. So this is uh, like the 14,000, the other one was like 25,000. So you could save quite a bit. Here we're saving 45% theoretically. That doesn't mean it's really going to happen that way. This is theoretically based on the information that we know and the projections that we are making. So here's an example of an office building, approximately five to seven stories, 200 GPM total. We split that between two pumps, 100 GPM each, 30 PSI in and on the suction, and 70 PSI discharge. So that's a 40 PSI boost, which equates to 92.4 feet. A constant speed, the size. Uh, you size a 5 PSI over to allow the PRV to maintain steady pressure because there's a pressure drop in the PRV, so you're losing pressure right there. The variable speed, variable speed pumps, you don't have to do that. If uh, when you're looking at motor horsepower, you take the flow in GPM times the head times the efficiency of the pump times 3960. Other calculations are for conversions only. The cost analysis only includes running power, not startup and shutdown, because startup has uh, an inrush of probably at least four times the amount of power, and then on shutdown, it's uh, also not very efficient. Here's a, uh, a nice simple rule of thumb for horsepower determination. If you take this is the pump brake horsepower, the head times the flow times the specific gravity, in our case it's one, divided by 3960 times the efficiency of the pump times the efficiency of the motor. Usually when we're talking about pump efficiency, we're talking about the, the pump efficiency. The motor already is required to be like 99% efficient, so that's not really a factor. So we could just take that off as well as the, the specific gravity and we're looking for the efficiency of the pump. Don't forget, when the pump slows down, a VFD, when that slows down, you're going to come out of that sweet spot of the most, the most highest efficiency that you designed the pump for, if it's actually running at that level, which mostly it isn't. But then uh, as it backs down, you're you know, you're dropping in efficiency. So you're saving a lot of energy, but it's not as efficient either. You can take a look at these pump curves and uh, we're trying to explain uh, some of the dynamics, what happens. And this is a, a flat curve pump. 
and uh, you can look at that as in, you know in comparison to a steep curve. Here we have a we took a, a 10 cents per kilowatt hour cost, and we figured that with this pump system, constant speed, the annual cost would be 27.33. That's, uh, you know, just estimated. If, if we look at the constant speed with the steep curve, it looks a lot different. And when you ride back on the curve, the uh, pressure is going up as the GPM goes down. Instead of being, uh, if it's a flat one, the pressure wouldn't go up so much. It would be more stable. So the pressure difference between the pump curve to the set point is dissipated by the PRV. That's why you have to have that pressure reducing valve. Because if you're not putting out the flow that you designed for, your pressure is going up. Well, pressure going up sounds like a good thing. If you designed it for, you know, say, 80 PSI, and now it's going up to 100 or 120 to the fixtures, that's no good. You can only take 80 to the, to the fixtures, if you recall. So here we are looking at uh, constant speed with the steep curve. It's, we're still 2730. So let's look at a variable speed with the flat curve. The pump slowed down to maintain pressure. Notice we don't have all the information on these curves. They were simplified. But here we show that the cost would be $2406 per year. So that's $300 less, which is a pretty good percentage of this. That's about 11%, uh, was it? So and here, if we look at variable speed, but this is a hybrid, one variable speed and one constant, and 40, 2467, so it was almost the same. And here's constant speed, flat curve pump. So it, we looked at these different, it should have said, I think that was supposed to be variable. Now we have variable before that. But you can see here that there's uh, quite a bit of difference and the flat curve has a maximum efficiency of 63%, where the, the steep curve has a maximum efficiency of 77%. But you can see we saved about one ninth, which is um, about 11% energy just on this simple, this simple look. And that's not very much. A lot of pumps are, uh, pumping systems could be 10 times that easily. So you have to look at uh, how the pump, the system was designed. Did we get an accurate suction pressure? I mean, like here, did they actually do a flow test? Doesn't look like it. What's the true suction pressure? And does it change during the year? Do we have accurate friction losses? Here we're talking about a rule of thumb of five feet per 100 feet. I use PSI and I have three PSI per 100 feet, which is somewhat similar at 50% for fittings. So we have to allow for every fitting and every valve as a little extra uh, pressure drop due to friction. And for a system of 100 GPM, we can add a two and a half inch copper pipe at 6.8 feet per second. I like to keep it to five feet per second or less. That's uh, 6.2 feet per 100 foot pressure drop. Uh, if you went to a 3 inch, you would be 4.5 inch, 4.5 feet per second. And that's more to my liking, and it would be 2.7 feet per 100 feet pressure drop. So the moral of this story is, when that velocity goes up, the pressure drop really goes up. It's, it's over twice as much. You know, it's almost three times as much on that two and a half inch pipe than it is on the three inch. So don't, don't uh, short the pipe size. Make it the right size. Don't make it too small. Because that extra friction is is uh, costing you efficiency. In a 500 foot run, the difference is 17 feet or 7.5 psi. So that means your pump had to be bigger. So you made your pipes smaller, but your pump less, you're going to wear the pipes out faster. So does that make sense? No. When we look at high system pressure switch on the discharge, uh, yeah, we need uh, to use in high pressure steep pump curve applications to prevent over pressurization. 
due to sensor failure. We're dependent upon that sensor to keep from overpressurizing. In Illinois and Chicago, where I am from, uh, booster pump, except those used for fire protection, is you, if it's used on an auxiliary pressure system, there shall be installed a low pressure cutoff switch. So if the pressure drops less than 5 psi, it will shut down on the suction side of the pump. So if there's a water main problem, it's not going to pump water back into the main. It's going to shut down. Shut off valve needs to be installed on the suction side. You'd want that anyway, wouldn't you? Within 5 feet from the pump suction inlet. And you need a pressure gauge. It should be installed between the shutoff valve and the pump. Always need to include your gauges and thermometers everywhere. Don't skimp. Thermal relief protection is very important. If the pumps keep running, a constant speed uh, might be hand off or no control, but variable speed may be in hand, sensor or other failure. If, if the pumps keep running, the pressures will go up. If you don't have a relief valve, the whole thing could explode because what's happening? All that energy is going into heat and heating up the water because it's not flowing. You have a dead end, deadhead uh, condition, so you're going full power to create heat, which will turn to steam and blow the whole thing apart. So you have to have relief valves and set those below 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Make sure you have that and pipe your header to the drain. Gauges, always gauges, gauges, gauges. Include gauges on the suction and the discharge. You want uh, pressure and temperature is how it should be called out for every project. We have installation and sizing guidelines uh, in the codes. In our area, we have Illinois and Indiana, Chicago. You might use uh, ICC or ATMO, or so the International Plumbing Code, or or the Uniform Plumbing Code, or maybe you use the National, depending on where you are, or maybe you have a different code where you are. So always make sure you're using the right code for the project. Thank you, and please. Please consult your local codes and the relevant codes for each project.